Let's go down the line and introduce ourselves. I'm Marty Clemens. I am the archivist, or I was the archivist at KBU Radio for a short-term project to help them um, with the Oregon Historical Society exhibit for their 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And now I work at Portland State University Library as an assistant archivist. And I'm Erin Yankee. I'm the program director at KBU and have been Hello, Paul. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, okay. I'm one of those well, people. <laughs> yes, I'm the program director at KBU um, and have been there on staff for about six years, but I've been a volunteer there since 1994. Yeah. Yeah. So we all have varying levels of um, like in-person history with the station, but um, one thing that we all kind of knew was that it was important to document and relay the history of 50 years of community radio as it had been kind of instituted at the station. And so that process started back, way back in the 45th anniversary with Aaron Yankee. Da, da, da. <laughs> um, we had, um, yeah, I had been the program director for about a year and it had been one of those times of like, let's, you know, like let's really do something special um, and 45 is one of those birthdays that people don't really pay attention to, except for record nerds totally do. And sometimes <laughs> they'll be like, 45 singles. So we had this 12-hour special where we got 45 DJs to play only 45 7-inch records. It took 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And we just like had beer and food. And it, was a, it turned out to be a great event because people could bring their families for 15 minutes. Like, you can bring a newborn play records for 15 minutes, mingle, and get out of there. And because it was from noon to midnight, you could come at any time. And it just, it turned out to be really fantastic. And it also was like, okay, 45 is pretty close to 50. What are we going to do? And just starting to get to start the conversation of what's in people's heads. And one of the things that we wanted to do, um, for our 40th anniversary, Cable had a big street party and a couple other things but we've really been in our own community for a long time. And so we're like, well, we, if we're 50, we're a proper institution. So how do we get proper institutional cred? And so we're like, I don't know, what about the historical society? So we just kind of had this idea that who, you know, who knew where it came from. And so Becky and I mm -hmm. strategized and then we called them in 2000 and 15? Yeah, 2015. I, I was hired early 2015, and so we started the process of, um, of trying to get in touch with them and setting up like a meeting late 2015. And, and they're they like, were like, okay, you're really enthusiastic. Like, <laughs> you probably just chill for six months. Yeah, call back in six months. And yeah, we're like, see if you're serious. Okay. Do you really want to do this? Yeah. Kind of thing. And so we waited. We waited. Plan. <laughs> Plan. <laughs> and that moment, um, you know, between meeting with the Historical Society, we set up a steering committee. We're trying to gauge interests within our community to participate with the process. And so we put out a big open call. We had a big meeting. Um, and even before then, at one of our staff retreats, I facilitated, I think, um, like a, an hour or two of brainstorming where everyone just sort of spitballed, like, what if we... What if we had like, you know, a water balloon fight for the 50th? What if like we published this? What if we did all this stuff? And so through that, we kind of um, with the lens towards that institutional um, credibility piece and what was accessible because like there was no way that we were going to like build a rocket, and, mm -hmm. you know, land the first KBU or on the moon. Yeah, we, we weren't going to take everyone to Vegas. Yeah. You know, like, what do people do for their 50th anniversary? Oh, we can't do that. <laughs> yeah, really that wasn't going to work. So, so we looked at it with feasibility and <laughs> credibility and whether or not, um, you know, it made sense for our community. So we whittled down a lot of stuff and then um, with the steering committee kind of gauged interest to see, hey, you're here in the room, like, what would you be interested in working on? And, you know, it became clear that there were some people who were really, really interested in kind of leading the process and like learning some other parts to it. And then others who were like, I'm, I think I'm more interested in talking to people. Like I, I wanna be the person to 
you know, do oral histories, I'm the person who might be interested in writing. So we're, we're kind of getting all this stuff together. And then we finally get a meeting with the Oregon Historical Society. Dun, dun, dun. And, and then they're like, <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah, so you're in, Becky and I are like, we're we prepared. had all fancy clothes. We had we like had a proposal. And then they're like, oh, cool. So we put you on the calendar for this. Great. And we're like, what? <laughs> oh, I mean, thank easy. you. Right. We could totally do this. So we thought we had to make a case. But luckily, they have like a gallery for like nonprofits and other things. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll kind of fast. Then we're like, cool, we can do this. Let's put up a collage wall over here. And oh, we can just get some photos. And this is awesome. Yeah. And we were kind of just like, we're used to having to do things on our own without very much knowledge and learning by doing. And then making, you know, gigantic mistakes along the way and learning from that and then sharing it at conferences with our friends, you know, <laughs> these kinds of learning, mm -hmm. learning uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. um, but the Historical Society saved us from ourselves because somehow... Something was canceled in the bigger gallery, and they're like, "Hey, would you like to move from your like small, out of the way gallery to the mezzanine gallery that everyone actually walks through on their way to the rest of the gallery?" And we're like, "Of course, yeah, yeah." We were really uh, stoked, and it also and constituted, yeah, <laughs> like a lot. It was a lot more space to cover. I think that um, to roll it back, our first um, like res reservation with the Oregon Historical Society was with their Hayes Gallery. And it, it it's basically like this kind of shape. It's the room that they use for their major giving parties. And so there's a bar in the middle. Um, like they had like wood hewn walls that you can't really modify or put vinyl or anything on. And so we were looking at, I think maybe like under 200 square feet of space yeah. to kind of work with and like a cool they had like a cool window display and we had this ridiculous idea of putting in an Beautiful. automaton and like let's make it look like you know like the city of portland but with like moving parts and cool stuff and so that that yeah. happened and then they offered the mezzanine and that increased our square footage by i think at least seven or eight hundred square feet and then all of a sudden we're in this really high traffic area and they had a bunch of different other features like um there's this little like alcove there are all these like columns and then all of a sudden we have the possibility of having like all this extra furniture inside of the exhibit and so um it was a really exciting and terrifying mm -hmm. like pros prospect like aaron mentioned um at this time we were kind of we were starting to discuss what budgets and what the details might look like um, with folks that would work with us in designing the exhibit. Um, we had two industrial designers on board and um, we were trying really hard to make sure that we were able to cover costs. And um, that was always, that was a fun learning <laughs> challenge because I, I think initially, what was it that? Our first budget that we had in the Hayes Gallery with what we needed were like $10,000. No problem. No problem. Okay. Yeah. No, it, it turned it, it turned turned it turned out to be more like around seventy thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So, you know, we, we kind of had like that moment. I mean, I'm, I'm the development director, so I you know, I was looking at that and uh, the applications that I would have to make for funders and I'm like, I don't know if this makes sense at all. Like let's sit down and like figure out like piece by piece what do we actually need to do? And it became really apparent that like, oh, well, um, I, I was just gonna, you know, somehow like the industrial designers, I'm gonna just throw it together. <laughs> you know, I was just gonna do that, but it'd be cool to be paid at all. And I'm like, okay, let's put that in the budget. Yeah. <laughs> what about like the materials? What are we putting things on? Oh, well, you know, this board or that, like, okay, well, how much do you think that's gonna be? How much like, is this oh. other thing? <laughs> Are we going to yeah. need electrical, like, you know, they have the track lighting. Are you going to be putting in new lighting configurations? We had a pretty outrageous idea, not outrageous, but to have like, you know, uh, uh, an interactive piece where people would be able to like, you know, hit a button and hear a thing. And, um, we and then record a thing and record a thing and then and yeah. all of this. So like that, that finding out the real cost was like the first step in having it be real. And the historical society, I think they're <coughs> used to working with like, 
you know, people who professionally put in exhibits and initially what was it like it's gonna be two hundred dollars a square foot kind of thing yeah and we're like <laughs> no it's not what <laughs> I, I don't know what it's gonna be but it's not gonna yeah, be that's that. like 140,000 yeah <laughs> so so we met in the middle but um mm -hmm. but so, in the interim I'm, I'm applying for grants I'm working with a fundraising committee to develop a major giving program well that hadn't existed at KBU in the past at all and so um, we're raising money and all this and then. Right. Um, also, as we're doing all of this, of course, we're like on the air creating content 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And re it was like, how are we going to get our past together enough to be an exhibit while we're also continuing with our present and our future? And we're like, we're going to kill ourselves. Like all of these steps were sort of like, oh, look, we're going to kill ourselves here. Let's not do that. How do we, you know, it's like, let's get help. Yeah, like all of a sudden it's, oh, multiple full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah. And so we ended up um, getting a grant. Yeah, we got a grant from the Miller Foundation for further digitization of our archives. And that's literally all the grant said, like for the digitization of the archive. Right. And then to back up with that, we've been working on, we have a, um, a small scale collection of old reel to reels small comparatively to what we've put out over the air for 50 years so small representation of what we've put out on the air so um about 40,000 actual pieces of real cds cassettes mini discs some old other familiar formats that mm -hmm. have died along the way um and so we've been working to get those digitized to then be able to have public access to them so that they can be accessible on the website. And that was another place where we're like, yeah, we just digitize them. Yeah. People then tell you, along, Marty's making the face, like, <sighs> um, you know, <laughs> if but, it was so easy. You know? Yeah. We're like, yeah. And then if you just digitize just them, then it doesn't matter. They're like not a thing on a shelf in cassette form. Now they're a thing on a virtual shelf in digital form and you still don't actually have access. Like there's all these other parts yeah. that actually make, you know, media accessible as you all know, as yeah. opposed to some other audiences that that takes a minute to yeah. sink in. Um, that's a critical piece of background because we, we had been working on the digitization of the audio archives for what at that point, like a year? A year, seriously. Yeah, yeah we had um, a digital steward resident from uh, WGBH and the American Archive of Public Broadcasting come in for about nine or ten months. Yeah. And she put together a, a really comprehensive like, uh, technical schema and plan for the archives themselves and what it meant to store things digitally, what it meant to have um, robust metadata information. But um, none of that work surrounded our paper archives. And it's, you know, we have a lot of like stuff that I think relates to the overall history of KBU, but like it's contextual, right? So you have to kind of know, you know, who's talking, what are they talking about? When are they talking where, like all of this stuff and the paper archives, they paint kind of like a, a more discreet picture of what was happening day to day because the paper archive was primarily these program guides that were published from 1971 to 2011. 11. So like there were, how many pages would you say of program guides over 10,000, right? Yeah, way more than that. Way more than yeah. that. So yeah. I wish I had the exact number. Yeah. Just to say it. <laughs> but we knew that that part was going to be critical to us being able to tell the story, to do the research, and then have um, a visual piece that we were able to relay on you know, museum walls. And so we got this grant from the Miller Foundation. And then um, we're like, oh, cool. Like digiti digitizing the archives includes paper because that's a huge part of it. It's part of the finding aids that you would be able to use in the archive. It gives you context. So we were like, okay, cool. Time to get that flatbed scanner warm and hot. Let's <laughs> hire somebody to help us out. And so we were so lucky. So lucky to be introduced to Marty, who works on a number of different archiving projects, but one was this scanning piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was hired in July of 
last year, it seems so long ago, but, um, <laughs> um, I had been working uh, in archives uh, in Portland for the past six years, and um, I just saw the ad for KB Radio, and I was like, radio, yes, music. <laughs> That's all I thought about was music. But um, um, when I began my short-term position at KBU, I knew very little about KBU and its history. Um, and I, but then six months later, I, I, was, I felt like I was at home, and I worked with an incredible dedicated staff and, uh, and volunteers, which are so important. Uh, when you want to maintain a huge uh, undertaking as an archive um, and a digitization project. Um, so, yeah, I'll discuss the paper archive. Uh, that was a little bit overwhelming at first, but um, as I was uh, at KBU uh, daily, surrounded by the voices and the people, it was just, it was incredible to witness history in the making, but also being connected to what had happened in the past 50 years. So it was really cool to be there from day to day. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Yeah. So just a few clips, <laughs> some gems from the archive. Uh, that was me after my first week. <laughs> I was in it heavily. Uh, the KBU uh, Radio Paper Archive contains over 50 years of materials. Uh, printed matter makes up the bulk of the collection, but it also contains uh, stickers, t-shirts, photo albums, uh, coffee mugs, and the majority of the printed material were, were the program guides, um, not only from KBU, but also from CRAB, mm -hmm. uh, which is based out of Seattle, but it's no longer. Yeah, they were founded before KBU and um, Lorenzo Milam um, was instrumental in this, the beginning of KBU, um, helping us set up the filings for the FCC at the time. So we're, we're considered part of the CRAB Nebula, the CRAB, CRAB being the very first KRAB um, community station of the kind that Lorenzo Milam was part in founding. Um, and so, yeah, the, the um, program guides, scrapbooks, correspondence also is a huge part, and then flyers and posters. Yeah. The poster collection is extensive, large and small format, and not only is it a large collection, but it also takes up a large size within the archive, so that's also something to consider when uh, producing an archive. Um, as an archivist, it is my job to preserve the material in its original order. So basically, when I walked in to KBU uh, the first day and was introduced to its nice storage facility, um, I wanted to take that and transform it using archival materials, such as folders and boxes, but also making sure that it stayed in its original order. Um, because doing so uh, keeps the records in the original arrangement that it was produced um, by the, the creator, by the, the person who might not have a name um, or might be a program director, uh, and making sure that their day-to-day -day activity uh, was kept in place as I'm trying to make that accessible to people, to the public. Um, and although original order is not, is, it is common when you first uh, get an archive, it also is very common for it to be uh, rearranged by outside sources. So um, if you are creating an archive uh, and you're the first one to, to see it, to see the collection, it's best not to just like <laughs> go through it and be like, this is cool, this is cool. It's just, uh, it's about original order and um, just keeping it in place. Uh, so let's see what's here. Okay. These are some cool ones. I love this one. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> how it used to be. Yeah, how it used to be. Uh, so with KBU's collection, I made certain that provenance was maintained, meaning that whatever originally, whoever originally created a fo photo album or placed items in a folder, um, that that order is preserved and the creator's name, if given, was kept to ensure survival of uh, the meaningful content within the records and its organization. This is also why metadata is important. 
Uh, metadata is any information given to an item that might be administrative, such as uh, date of acquisition, uh, descriptive, color, shape, size, or structural, which is like page numbers. Um, and metadata offers, uh, it differs between institutions and collections, but it is also like the most important piece of uh, information that you could put onto a, an item within the archive. Mm -hmm. Uh, because anybody who like sees uh, Dr. Strange loves children, if you can add on any information, since I wasn't around when this took place, any information that if Becky was there that she had about it and could tag on to the, the piece within the digitization process would be helpful to any researcher in the future. Um, yeah, as a whole, uh, <laughs> KBOO's archive, and I think Becky touched on this, is a rich example not only of radio history, but uh, the cultural history of Portland. Um, after thousands of posters, flyers, and photographs, um, and program guides passed through my hands, I now I'm having time to reflect on how important KBOO's archive is to Portland's overall historical record. Uh, one can easily witness like the um, cultural movements and uh, political shifts that took place through these materials, not just on a local level, but nationally and internationally. And there are many phases of an item's life cycle within an archive from analyzing and processing to scanning the item, digitizing and adding metadata. So it is important that effective collective collection management um, will ensure long-term physical survival of the collections. Um, and then Becky and Aaron both touched on Selena's uh, mm -hmm. process. I was not part of the audio digitization, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> it's waiting for you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <It's forever. laughs> um, but I have worked with like transferring and digitizing other audio at other institutions. Um, and so if you do have audio in your collection or video, um, it's easy to, uh, I can talk about that actually. Um, but I, I had put that there's 5,000 items of audio, but there's way more. Yeah, I think, um, is that number like public affairs? I thought it was more like 7,500. Uh, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the, to, to, be, to, to, to be totally, um, upfront about it. I mean, we're in a long term archiving process. And so I think we're in year two of it. Yeah, um, we have two other years, it may extend longer, it depends on what available funds that we have for it. But um, at the moment, like our first year was really kind of focused on creating the infrastructure and technical understanding that was necessary for us not only to be able to add the information that we need, as Marty mentioned, the really crucial metadata information, but also to like to test service providers, make sure that we were contracting with like really responsible, um, you know, digitization experts like Bayback or what was the other one? Uh, there's one in New York that we're part of now. It's it's part um, of the the process of trying to get yeah. funding from federal sources as well. Like you have to have done. It's basically like an RFP, you get quotes, but instead of just being like, what up, quotes, here, give me a quote, you have to literally like try the service and see like, you know, did the archive piece get preserved fully? How was the quality of the recording? How, what kind of technical de metadata did they provide? Mm -hmm. You know, was the service timely? Like there's all this sort of checking out. And so the first year was really dedicated to that. And I think we, archive or we digitized how many pieces like maybe a hundred yes yeah, something, something pretty small amount yeah yeah the second year was really focused on bringing public awareness to the archive through the 50th anniversary <laughs> the timing kind of worked out and so part of it was us doing this historical society exhibit but we were continuing the work to get people aware like to teach people that this archive exists and it exists as a really crucial piece of our collective history here in this geographic region and in public radio as well. Mm -hmm. So us doing that, that was the, uh, the kind of focus of the second year. And then 
for the third and fourth year and any subsequent years, that would be really specifically dedicated to like the hard work of getting everything digitized. And with the paper archive, in the most like we've we'll get to the challenges when it comes to the exhibit itself but the paper archive and it's it, it most of it is digitized at this point and so that gives us a really amazing place to start and a place to relate the audio materials whatever historical things were happening at the time and the paper archive all together so now we have a fuller history of our shared heritage and like the history of Portland and Oregon for the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. And um, before you go back to it, like yeah. one of the things that's been happening internally at KBOO is people are like, oh, you're working on the archive? I'm trying to downsize and move into my retirement home. Right, here's, here's a ton of stuff. five boxes of the whole <laughs> history of our folk show from 1971 yes. to 2010 awesome. before I started you know, so, which is great, but I, so, um, we've gotten also, we're starting to get more of the paper material, not from the KBOO facing outward to the public, but also like internal volunteer stuff. That's a little bit more like, if you don't do your shifts, we're going to take you off the air in that kind of tone. Or like, you can see more of like the ups and downs of actual volunteer management and, yeah. um, and the structure of KBOO of Portland changing in how the volunteers are changing or how like, you know. Because they're they're really the, the, the real indicators of the action that was happening. I mean, we have these audio pieces, we've got like ephemera, like the paper archive, but at the same time, like the people, like people's lived stories and the tens of thousands of people that came in and out of KBU in order to create the broadcast, like that, that's really where I think the interesting stories happen. And also we'll, we'll get to this, but official, uh, not official because that sounds dumb. No, organizational communications like program guides, like annual reports and all that demonstrate a bias of like management and staff. And that's undeniable because mm -hmm. who's making it, right? So when you take a look at things like the volunteer guides, the volunteer newsletters, you know, the missives that people sent each other when contending against like major programmatic changes, you know, that gives you a different lens. And I think it's far more equitable than saying like the definitive thing for KBOO's history is the program guides. But at the time, that's literally all we had. So <laughs> have you been getting more? Yeah, I balance? have. I, I can't wait to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a big box of awesome, awesome hand. Like like one of our early um, office managers, Mary Orr, had been collecting materials since like 1968 and it it is an fascinating and incredible like view into the history of KBOO and is also terrifying to me because I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to work with Marty I learned so much about how you don't mess with your archive because <laughs> I'm just like I want to go through it all and I'm gonna like put it out of order and I'm gonna pick the things that I want and I'm gonna touch it with my bare hands and maybe after lunch and Cheetos. <laughs> at the same time I'm snacking and I was like Marty would kill me I'm totally not doing that <laughs> so I haven't really dug into it too much but yeah um so having Marty and working with you like it has been an incredible learning opportunity but also um Marty brought us some real like real realness when it comes to like how you interact with the paper archive and then try to do what you like what we had intended to do which was to have it ready for the exhibit but also to have it searchable and OCR'd for reference as like researchers would be able to use and the public would be able to interact with it so we're like okay so we want everything but we don't know what to do so <laughs> yeah the digitization project of uh so many pieces of history was uh, was a whirlwind of an experience. <laughs> um, but I did have uh, outside resources um, that I worked with with Portland State. Um, we uh, two seconds. I was like, I can't do this on my own. So um, hired an outside uh, vendor to. Um, take that undertaking and uh they produced an amazing uh collection for us of uh those uh program guides um 
and then I was able to scan the posters and flyers and photographs on my own. Um, so many photographs. So many photographs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the digit. So I'm going to go back to this. Um, the digitization project. Uh, before you start digitizing anything in your um, institution, you'll want to put together a digitization plan um, that outlines what the goals of your digitizing either your audio or your video is. Like, what is the purpose? What What is the outcome that we want to see? Um, so both digitized and born digital recordings. I love saying that. Born digital. Born digital. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a song. Um, <laughs> or they, anime or something. They need uh, multiple copies made. And, and then they also need to be backed up, filed in storage. Um, that is backed up on a regular basis. Some people have been talking about the cloud. But you need to, uh, you know, know about storage capacity and um, read a cloud, the clouds, like whichever cloud you choose, uh, their terms of use, because you might not own it in a few years. Like it, it's all about rights and um, production. Um, and then how often do you back up once you're um, once you are stored? And then remember that you need the space for the metadata as well, because all that information takes up, um, takes up a lot of space. And then if you are working with um, like reel to reels or uh, video, <clears throat> it's not VHS, but the tiny ones that went into a bigger VHS. Like all those machines are obsolete, so you need to figure out um, like how to get original sources to transfer, because um, as we all know, the landscape is changing. Uh, digital technologies are developed, and then at the same time, the original materials are degrading at a rapid pace. So it's a constant learning process on how to best transfer and preserve these items, and in most cases, particular to place and format. Um, I just put this guy up here because I love this photo. <laughs> uh, so a few things with like, just say a real to or any vintage format, have the machine checked out by a qualified technician uh, because the machine is the first thing to touch those real to real tapes. Mm -hmm. And um, usually- one step away from destruction. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> And, you know, those tapes have been sitting in boxes for years and you want to play the reel to reel or the videotape once only um, to get it digitized and then that's it. Um, and then adjust input, input output levels as needed um, because you might get some nasty static on the digitized end. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, advice to myself and everyone around me. Stay cool, calm and collected while we're digitizing this project. Um, and then use the in-house archives database. Uh, Which we have resource space for. Um, resource space. Yeah. It, um, it, it houses everything. We wanted everything to be in one place. And so yeah. um, you populated the entire thing, uh -huh. uh, the digitized archives. The there, paper, yeah. The paper. But that's where we're also keeping our audio as you get it digitized. Mm -hmm. And then that's our next step of the plan is to um, connect that to the website so that the all of the old stuff is publicly accessible and searchable. Yeah, so any consistent cataloging of the audio metadata or the paper archive metadata um, will be preserved in this database. And, and it's going to be constantly updated by volunteers or by staff. Mm -hmm. And so just making sure that it's um, updated as needed and so these things stay obtained and logged. Um, any information on the program, date, place it was recorded, original file format, size, conditions of the original audio, everything you can think of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just put it in there. Why not? Um, <laughs> it's their ideas and examples of strong uh, metadata. And then a finding aid is a clear example of um, having an outside source come in and, and saying, hey, I would love to look at a program guide from October 1978. Where can I find it? Hopefully on the finding aid, they'll see that it's in box three, folder 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Because you, you do reference the physical object instead of just the, the, um, the digitized one. Because it could be like they're doing a comparison between archives or right. yeah. um, there could be like some valuation thing or I don't know. I, I'm I'm throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but then with radio archives, it's it's a fairly new uh, study, and so radio is prompting uh, the development of a new emerging field, and that's called radio preservation studies. It's just like film preservation, 
but um, because it's so new, it's it's I'm not completely aware of like the new um, the best practices for radio archives. There's plenty for audio and sound mm -hmm. um, archives. However, um, it's you know this is all rapidly changing, but there are resources. Yes. <laughs> Such good resources. Radio Preservation Task Force. Yay! That was created, I think, four years ago. Um, and they're for, to support collaboration between uh, researchers and archivists toward the preservation of radio history. And they developed an online inventory of American radio archival collections focusing on sound holdings. And they can help in identifying and saving endangered collections if needed. There's also the Library of Congress, who um, have this trustee manual on care handling and storage of AV materials that includes um, any kind of audio visual, like wear gloves when handling tapes um, <laughs> type thing. Um, and then uh, I just want to end with uh, saying that each item in an archive tells a story. and. Um, now that it's in a box on a shelf doesn't mean that it's obsolete. It's still breathing. It's it's a it's a living object, and uh, having joined forces with Oregon Historical Society, mm -hmm. and creating this exhibit um, is a perfect example of how history and community can come together to create um, something significant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that that was a critical. Marty's work is a critical part of our creation of the exhibit that. We collaborated with the Oregon Historical Society on um, them giving space and um, giving us directions and I mean, how how to do it because you know I would have never uh, really knew that you there was a certain way to talk about like your history so that it didn't indicate that it came from them that was kind of a big deal that like I had to keep in mind and as we were writing things found out um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty intense. But we also in the future will be collaborating with Oregon Historical Society, um, I think for the maybe the long term preservation and storage of the materials once they've been digitized completely. Um, they have an incredible holding facility that they partner with a number of different educational institutions and nonprofits to store things in like a temperature, uh, temperature controlled and um, like, uh, you know, have you seen it? It's I so cool. Haven't been it's there so yet. Awesome. But yeah, it's in Gresh it's out in Greshlin. It's Gresh really cool. So, <laughs> so yeah, but but partnering them with them was very um, was was very important and also um, like eye opening. But um, yeah, we with the archives that we digitized, were able to put together um, this this exhibit, but also with like the help of. A legion of volunteer people doing volunteer stuff to help us with staff. Um, I mean, it was a year-long process of putting this together. There were definitely challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and we can spend a couple minutes talking about them, but we'll want to leave space for yeah. you all to ask your questions of why you came here and what you were hoping to learn from us too. But um, one of the big um one of the things that i want to talk about too is that like we had these amazing resources in being able to have selena be with us for 10 months have marty be with us for six months um but we don't currently have anyone on staff to do this we don't so um just you just have to start and there are the best practices and sometimes best practices are not going to be doable for you so put dates on everything at least and know what the date means if it means that it was when it was recorded or when it was broadcast mm -hmm. like that's a great start because then you can go back to like who was around then who can we ask questions of what this is about but this is for your on ongoing archive though. yeah like, just yeah. in general date everything all the time mm -hmm. lean over into your interviews today is you know <laughs> april 20 Eight? I don't know. Know the date. First of all, know the date. Get the date right. Then put it in all of your things. It's super, you know, so these things. So, you know, we as we talk about best practices and challenges, like that is definitely something to aim for. And yet don't let don't let not being perfect stop you from like 
collecting yeah. things and doing your best. Um, one of the other things is that um, you do really need a staff or really dedicated volunteer to lead this. Uh, I, KBU has this amazing thing and I encourage you all to get this instituted in your workplaces, but after you work at KBU for five years full time, um, you got to take a three month sabbatical and it is mind blowing and it's awesome. <laughs> so do that in your workplaces, but maybe don't necessarily leave for three months right before a major deadline, deadline <laughs> exhibition in the middle of it, possibly. <laughs> Maybe well, not. Maybe it worked out okay. This but is one of the challenges. We, we're a community station, and so we want to work with as much of our community and telling the story because they're instrumental in making that happen as we could. And so we had put together a number of different, like I mentioned, um, committees to work on different parts of the project. And um, we had worked um, with a group of volunteers to try to write the story, the one that we, we, we would be including on everything. So the uh, catalog that you have in your bags today, um, the historical society text that goes on the walls, all the stuff that goes on the website, we wanted to have that come from like a, a, a kind of like playbook that was more comprehensive, but we could draw information from, and it would be Kebu story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the process of creating that <laughs> turned out to be that Marty got all of the program <laughs> guides digitized, yeah. digitized, Becky and a group of volunteers turned all the information in the program guide into a 62 page document of things that were interesting, happening in the station, out of the station, specific programs, guests, start and stop dates of programs. Um, I also, mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of, we made a calendar oh, yeah. for the year yeah. that has all these dates in it. So I can give you one after this is over. Um, so identifying all that information. And so then I came back from vacation and it was like, great, now you've got a month, three weeks hmm. to turn this 62 page document into a, whatever well, like, like the, the um, like amounts of words that we had to work with like I think we had under I think we had like a hundred words every panel we had yeah well we had about 500 panels. words for every kind of chapter that we identified yeah. so it was like okay for 500 words a decade mm -hmm. and 500 words for kind of bonus like what was happening so you'll see it was like 80s programming and then like 80s like oh we moved we bought a building this mm -hmm. happened, this. So it was like about a thousand words per decade. So 62 pages, thousand words a decade. Then that got condensed to a hundred words per panel. Yeah, that was intense. So, <laughs> yeah. A um, big challenge. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then at that point you're like, okay, we've, you know, we've had all this input, we've had all this community um, selection and letting people know what's going on. And then you just shut the door and you're like, okay, Right, 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 right. I mean, right. there was a moment yeah. where we were on Aaron's kitchen floor with a butcher paper and big markers, and we were like, okay, let's get it. Like, yeah, and then we're like, no, this, da, da. Yeah. So, um, so that it just, you know, it just gets condensed down. And then you'll see what is there. If you go to the Historical Society, mm -hmm. you'll see what 100 words we chose. And then the Historical Society <laughs> is like, you can't say we, because right. we means us, the Historical Society, oh, and wow. when you say that. we, you mean KBU, mm -hmm. and you can't do that. So right. that was part of the like, yeah, oh right, we is, we is different. Yeah, issue that we Who would have noticed? And also, you know, like <laughs> Just, we're, yeah. we're self-styled radical radio makers. And so like, I, I wrote one about like, what was the nature of funding for community and public radio? And it was pretty inflammatory. And they were like, <laughs> no, you can't. You can't do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, you can mention the thing about, like, the percentage of funding coming from individuals and all this, but can you take out the part where, like, you're, like, reaming commercial radio? That'd be great. And I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, but, all but right. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And they were really great to work with in that they you know had a couple things but mostly we mm -hmm. knew 
what their rules were and parameters were early enough to avoid yeah. it. But those two things at the end were kind of like, oh, yeah. Okay. And, and the pulling together of the physical exhibit itself. Like we, we were really fortunate to work with somebody who had like put on a, f a few exhibits and presentations of this incredible industrial designer and um, designer in general, Rob Lacoste. Mm -hmm. um, so when it came down to it, the or historical society, and I'm sure that's the same for almost all exhibits in institutions is like you got just a little time to get your stuff together for them to load out and for you to put in what you're going to put in. And so all of that had to be in place, everything together, deliveries timed exactly so that we could get it in in a day. And we did. And mm -hmm. so that was in an incredible success and seeing it for the first time, I totally cried. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, also Becky's planning like the opening and the major donor events and all these other things to go along with it. <laughs> and too, running the radio are, station. Uh, yeah. yeah and, and then just running the radio station. Yeah. yeah. No big deal. So, yeah. So there's a lot of other factors that are, you know, part of our 50th anniversary that we can talk about um, later. But I think that's kind of the, those are the main, main challenges main things but um you know, people have just been like um really excited to mm -hmm. see it in this like you know well-known institution and um yeah there's been some some interesting uh community pushback of some people not being included and um some some stuff we definitely missed and some stuff that you're like okay so we had 500 words for a decade mm -hmm. and we didn't mention and anyone as a person, you know, we kept it, you know, it was just like, oh, these shows or KBU did this thing, but we didn't mention any people. Mm -hmm. And once people realized that, oh, not only did we not mention them, but we didn't mention anyone, right. Right. then there was like some, some things that we could have explained better to, to the volunteers of like, this is how it's going to look. This is how the process is. But you know, we were on the floor in my kitchen, so we were yeah. explaining <laughs> things to the volunteers yeah. as well as we could have. So that's something, too, of, like, taking a little bit more time to let people know about the process. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, would an institutional buy-in includes all the people that are stakeholders in that organization. So anybody you volunteer with, your audiences, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just, like, any other thing that has to do with, like, you know, the organizational back end of a structure where you're like, okay, so like we have to do this budget, but what does a budget mean? What does it constitute? What are the individual parts? And that education, that training is the responsibility of the people leading the effort. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we didn't really know. What we had hoped for was through innumerable calls to the community for participation, like all, I mean, all the time we were like, okay, can we all get together and work on this thing? Hey, do you have any ideas? Hey, do you like, would you like to come in and read through the program guide so we can write this back like story? Um, e even when you do that, it's not enough to explain what you're doing. And so that was a critical learning that I had as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, we're doing this exhibit, but that means anything to anyone, you know, like the communication needs to be like really distilled and on point. And that's something over time that I've learned. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is that we are like, this is very much a launching off point. And so we have been doing <laughs> mm -hmm. and have planned a lot of like specials for particular communities because also we're a radio station. So it's like, well, yeah. let's celebrate on the air. Like people are used to listening to us and that's their relationship. So let's like, I think our in May, we're doing um, a four hour like, women's history so there's people who've been here since 1971 mm -hmm. who are producing like two hours of like women programmers how's it been remember when it really sucked in this ways and then things changed and now it's good and now this is really good and it sucks in this way it's cool look at progress okay mm -hmm. you know and celebrating and playing stuff um so there'll be different on-air specials throughout the year um and i think our next one is the founders special so we'll really yeah. focus on the first like five to ten years of folks Mm -hmm. who are around um yeah some of the recordings of milam that we have yeah oh, cool. um totally you know. and then being able to also like we're the historical society is not the end of our celebration it's like 
It's Come do stuff piece. on the air. We're collecting oral histories all year. <laughs> We're 50 all year. Mm -hmm. We're doing things all year. So that also helped people to be like, oh, right. We had a party in, in January mm -hmm. and that's not it. Like come to the street party, come to the birthday party on June 3rd, the birthday cake potluck. Yeah. Yay. I mean, a, um, lot, a lot of our of things stuff. for the year, like the, the public outreach piece was modeled on a, like, we recently rewrote our mission statement, like uh, since I joined in 2015. And, you know, part of it is like the representation of unheard perspectives and stories, which we thought would be like this first part of the year. And then the other part is the sharing of knowledge with other people in our cohort, broadcasters and community organizers and such. And so, you know, our inspiration for like the last half of the year was more of like sharing with the community and that's why we're um, hosting the GRC in October. So we have, what we wanted to do is just model like what we do and how we serve our mission and have this be a specific example of what that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to add something to the volunteer. Um, it was really refreshing to walk into KBU and see like a strong method was already in place regarding volunteers and how they can help Mm -hmm. and be of assistance in any kind of process within KBU. So that was really cool. And also when you deal with uh, community-based archives or any independent archives, volunteers, it, it needs to be open to the public. It needs to be open to who your audience is and making them feel like they have a say in um, helping this history or your history um, be made and yeah, accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Questions? Yeah, we got a microphone for you. <laughs> you can just pass it to somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah, and as you guys are figuring out what your questions are for us, I think also um, it is just important to, to start where you are again because part of, you know, it's like we do have this alternative history, and if we weren't, you know, like, we're used to keeping our own history because other people aren't doing it for us. Or if they are, they're doing it in a very uh, yeah. niche generic, and yeah. generic and tokenizing way or whichever way. And so it's really important to have our own stories that we're collecting at all times to be able to be like, uh, 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 right. that's not how that went down. Remember this, you know, and have that, the, the proof of the voices that are there, the people that were there. So, um, this is also not meant to be intimidating, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I got right. boxes of flyers that now I try to put in order because of party, you know, or, <laughs> or information or community events or newspaper clippings that I have of things that, um, don't throw it away. Yeah. That's, no. yeah. It's like, if I want to throw, if I want to get rid of stuff, then I know to give it to someone who can actually properly take care of it until it's needed. And, and making sure that you have your, your, your partnerships in place and well in hand before you start, like you, before a year before you think you're going to launch a thing. Like we, At least. The, the funding piece, like that, that takes in of itself a lot of extra like time and effort because now you're meeting with people, you're pitching the idea, and then it takes them time to give you a check <laughs> too. And that can be critical to whether or not you can fulfill your plan. But we, us talking to the historical society so far in advance, I mean that that gave us the space and opportunities to be able to really like you know make this collection shine in this exhibit. So mm -hmm. if it weren't for that, if we were like okay, like we want it in January, let's start talking to them in October, then that would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, one thing I'm intrigued with is that you maintain the importance of preserving physical assets. Uh, quite often, uh, and I've seen this myself, where once you <laughs> digitize media materials, then there quite often is a pervasive attitude of, okay, we've got this digitized, so let's toss all of the physical assets because we don't need them anymore, we've got them stored digitally. Mm -hmm. um, what are your practices for uh, maintaining those physical assets? And, and do you store them on site or do you have locations where 
those can be maintained in a, in a proper environment? What, what's your, your process? Yeah, um, I know at Portland State, they are in a, I don't, are, is that room in Kebu? Is it, it's we not it temp storage. controlled, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so, but it's also like, it's kept routinely because of its positioning, um, like pretty cool and dry, um, which is a like lucky coincidence. Um, but that's where things have been stored as of now. Mm -hmm. um, into the future though, once we have that part completed and we have the necessary funds to partner fully, um, we will be moving them to a more temperature controlled and environmentally controlled storage. Because like, you know, that is the pervasive attitude. Once things are digitized, now you have all this free room and turn it into something else. And, and that's not necessarily bad because what you're trying to do is serve your communities and sometimes you have a premium of space. But, but the ephemeral aspect of it, the fact that it existed as a physical object shouldn't ever be undermined and like kind of forgotten in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just also just, you know, off of the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no boxes off of the on floor. the floor. Um, the check Hi. for leaks always. <laughs> um, even if you're so familiar with the space, just always check for leaks because you just never know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then once you can, if you can get that air temp controlled room specialized, yeah, go for it. It, it always, yeah, that helps. Yeah, And just like our process of it, um, we had sort of thought in the beginning of thinking about the digitization that we're like, great, we're just going to get a huge grant and we're going to do it all at once and then it'll be done as a collection and then we can move it on. And how it's actually worked out is that um, we're getting grants from native don native grantees to digitize the native section of the archive. We're yeah. getting grants from different community LGBT grants, smaller grants to digitize LGBTQ history. Mm -hmm. So um, because of that sort of process, um, it's things are kind of selective here and there. And so when the whole thing gets done, then we as KBU will treat it like a whole collection and the Historical Society, ha we've kind of talked to them and informally they've agreed to take it mm -hmm. um, when that happens. Wow. And then when that happens, then we'll really look and see what that means for mm -hmm. like the practicalities of it. So I don't, where are you, where are you from? Metro East. Oh, great. Yeah. So yeah, just kind of Matt Cowan is a total treasure. So yeah, um, you could talk to him about what they do out there. What was the most interesting thing you guys learned when you went through the archives that you were like, whoa, I didn't know this, or this is so amazing? Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to pick one. Um, I mean, for me, I think it was the, um, I think it was the 1975 voter referendum of Oregon. Like, it, it seems like a really prosaic piece of history, but after, I think, like Watergate, people were very attuned to the fact that like there was corruption in government. And so there was a group out of Bend, I don't remember the name, but they had contacted and worked out um, like a coordinated voter referendum with all media around the state. So including like newspapers and radio stations and things like that. Um, and, you know, it was a place for people to like air their frustrations, but also to put together, um, you know, what, they thought needed to be done like collectively and so um seeing evidence of that like there was a you know referendum like send in sheet and one of the program guides and all of this um i had no idea that happened i had no idea that there was a group of people that like came out and did this i think probably herculean amount of work to make sure that everybody had a voice beyond simply their vote because they had lost faith in that and so um, that was pretty mind blowing to me and that KBU was part of it. And while it's not specifically KBU, it was something that I was like, wow, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, because I basically saw and viewed every single piece of paper in that place, <laughs> Um, there was too many, but I, it just made me realize, uh, like I said earlier, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with KBOO's history. And so just seeing program flyers um, from the early 70s regarding um, LGBT voices on radio, 
um, and you know African American voices of the of Northeast Portland. Um, just knowing that they had, uh, you know, that access to radio and to get their voices heard on air, it, it kind of blew my mind. Just mm -hmm. knowing that that was that that existed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I. I don't know. There's so many things, but my favorite parts were like, um, we have a lot of really long-term volunteers and it was so amazing to find a photo oh God, of yeah. someone like Shahid Hamid, who was an old a producer here as well, you know, and he's like, look, he's like 30 doing these like interviews out in the street and these photographs and like carrying this big tape recorder on his <laughs> side and just like, and you're like, Shahid, and you know, and looking at, you know, and you're mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're pushing 80. And he's like, oh my God, you know, yeah. and just like the photographs of people who are still around and then they're, you know, like, oh yeah, I remember him. And, you know, and then you would just get those moments. Mm -hmm. And I think that also really happened to Marty a lot. Like, working in the middle of the conference room and people would just like walk through and take a break and be like, what's that? Oh yeah. my God. And then I remember, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. It would just stop and just stories would just flow out of people. And, and I'm and trying just... to take notes as they're talking. Yeah. Yeah. Metadata. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're like, oh, yeah. but yeah, Marty's trying to keep us on task. Right. <laughs> of course. Oh, I love those. <laughs> so it's about gaming. <laughs> yeah, gaming. All of these, so you digitize all these uh, physical assets, so the, the the paper. So, are they in a database? How how what do you use to to keep all that the digital uh, archives in order now? Yeah. So right now they're in resource space and um, resource space. yeah, resource space. Um, Ha I'd say probably half of them have metadata attached. They all have file names. They all have, um, it was a structured file name. Um, but because of the short-term project that I, um, that I was hired on, um, I was not able to enter metadata onto every single piece. Um, and so that's why um, volunteers and mm -hmm. other people can um, help out with that process. But um, yeah, so they're living on resource space and um, yeah, it's just an ongoing project to keep that up to date. And that just sits on a computer at, at, at the radio station? Yeah, it's on a server. So um, all of the computers in-house can access it. Oh. Um, and then eventually like that's part of like the next three year project is to get it talking to the Born Digital Archives that are on our website and then they will talk to each other and Got it. live together and all that stuff. So um, Al Bursch from Oregon or from OPB uh, is a volunteer now. Uh, you might know him as your neighbor. Um, <laughs> is our weekly. He comes in about once a week to kind of keep an eye to make sure that we're not going off the rails of you know of like oh here's someone who brought in their whole collection. I'm going to just digitize stuff and just start throwing numbers on that already on belong there, to somebody else. So that kind of thing. So um, we <laughs> definitely need babysitters until we um, get another in-house professional person. to Which is what we're working on yeah. right now. We, um, we're partially funded for one through the Collins Foundation. I have um, another grant in for the other half of their workload. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to have somebody hired by... When are we re-advertising? Doing the hiring process in, uh, I think, June? Yeah, so in yeah. the last half of the year, then we're able to hire somebody full-time, at least for a short-term project. So, yeah. Yeah. One of the things we found out about archivists is that the part-time archivist job is not particularly popular. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, which is something that Marty lets know about the archivist culture, is that like the shorter jobs that are full time are more appealing to that community because we're it was like oh yeah part time job awesome we wouldn't have known there's no, no way that we were gonna know that yeah <laughs> so instead of doing you know we're like oh longer work time that makes sense and then yeah we're like oh we're not actually getting people to apply for this job but when you know like are we getting the word like what's what's the problem here and then you know you ask the the experts and then they're like oh yeah this yeah. is this is what the problem is with your job. It's not the job. 
Yeah. It's definitely not the job. And, yeah. and building an archive is like, it's more than just having an archivist. It's having a database like person who can like create yeah. like the specific back end mm -hmm. for everything. How does it talk to your website? You know, who are the like facility managers that are making sure that your archive is stored on site is done well and like under like uh, favorable conditions. Yeah. You know, uh, what about the staff and like yeah. admin time that goes into, I mean, like for what Aaron was mentioning, we were only able to fund this so far through innumerable small grants. So that means you're putting together just a hell of a lot more work for whoever's doing the admin, because now you've got like, you know, 10 times the amount of reporting that you would have if you had one larger grant. So like that has to be part That's of your process point. too, mm -hmm. and planning way, way far in advance. I mean, yeah. if, if you have a, like a specific archive, um, you know, making sure that you budget in not only the time it takes to digitize things, which it, it's a lengthy process, even with a service provider. Um, then also on the front end, being able to build that, whatever the program is, making sure that you have like a full understanding of the staffing needs that you have, and then having enough time to build in your like relationship building so that you can have like a more unified like funding strategy instead of like, okay, well, here's where we are and this is what we need for the rest of this year, you know, or this is the specific position. Will you help us, you know, finish this out? You know, it, it, it creates, it's a different like it need for approach and more meaningful. Mm -hmm. you know like planning yeah and um i am blanking out mm -hmm. on his name but paul you'll help me remember hopefully but there is a uh, the in mcminnville oregon um there's a professor there who's actually on the radio preservation task force oh, michael nice. huntsberger huntsberger oh, thank you yeah um so he's a point. great <laughs> yay um he's a great local ish resource regional resource on what they're doing and um, how you can tap in to get help from that organization or just get their reports that they've written or um, you know, kind of see what they're up to and how, um, how it's going there, even though I know this is a, you know, a two thirds of a TV conference. Yeah. But I think just like you know, community media is, it's, just, it's so important to have this preserved. As, yeah. as well as, you know. And that any of it exists is a testament to, you know, like keeping the memory and memory the words of people that don't ever get representation preserved. Because I, as far as I know, like for commercial TV and stuff, they just re-record it over everything. Mm -hmm. Like there, there aren't really archives in that way. Yeah. And so when you have the opportunity to preserve something, it is your responsibility to make sure that it's done respectfully and with an eye to long-term like health of the archive. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Crab Archive up in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, Chuck, uh, what's his last name? Reinch. Chuck Reinch is doing that work with um, the input of like the, the volunteers that were part of that radio station, but did it mostly on his own. And so there's not only audio but paper archives as well and we were totally honored to have him join us for the opening of the event mm -hmm. so um but check it out it's all online he's done an amazing yes. job yes. especially for it being like a you know an independent archive done essentially by one person absolutely wow. yeah and he can speak to that like you learn so much at the end that you should have done at the beginning but at least it's done <laughs> so yeah um yeah we've got about like three or four or five minutes left if anybody has anything Burning. <laughs> also, if you ever, pitch? yeah. <laughs> so uh, we had everyone here on, on a podcast we do called Radio Survivor. It's a radio show as well. Uh, and along with Rob, their industrial designer, but we've also recently talked to Chuck Reinch mm -hmm. about the oh. Crab Archives and one of our collective members is on the Radio Preservation Task Force. Yeah. So I want, I'll pass around these cards so you can learn more about our site if these kind of things. We try to cover it. We're not comprehensive, but... Um, try to give you some information as well about radio preservation and community media preservation. And, and yeah. if you ever think of something, you know, in the future and you're like, well, you know, we want to kind of look over our archive and figure out how to preserve it and make it publicly accessible, then, you know, just let us know. And um, we'd be happy to give you insights and to, to answer any questions you might have or share our secrets. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, our not so secrets. Our not so secrets, which we <laughs> never really keep anyway. But <laughs> we try not to. It's community media. Yeah, gotta, that's right. you can't make all the mistakes on your own. We got to share the mistakes. Right, we all make them <laughs> together. The yeah. Um, speaking of the archive, we used pieces of it to create this annual report, which was in, indeed a calendar. And it's got wonderfully repurposed <laughs> photos from the archive. This is a photo of um, then station manager Vicky Stapiello and another staffer working on the build out of our studios in 1981. Um, and the, a little bit of the plan, which is, I would say, my very favorite visual piece because it's like, it's so colorful. It's got really cool Art Deco font face. I'm just, I'm in love with it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, check it out. It also has all of the um, current shows that are happening, their, um, their anniversaries, like the day that they started on the air. And some of these are pretty intense. Like, you know, we had our evening news, very, the very first evening news broadcast in 1972. So... Mm -hmm. All right. And if you're, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how long some of you are in town for, but um, there's always someone at KBU. And there's always on, the Oregon Historical Society. Go see it. Totally, yeah. yeah. The Historical Society is open today till 5, and then tomorrow, I think, from 10 to 5. 5, yeah. Um, but there's always, you know, KBU is officially, like, it's closed for business, but there's always a DJ there, so there's a button, and you can just be like, you know, oh, I'm just picking up something, you know, and then, get, you know, give yourself a little guided tour. There's someone there. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's being recorded. Oh, my God. That. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, or tomorrow, you know, doors get unlocked at nine. So and if you just want to walk around through it or come next time you're in town, you maybe have a yeah. little more time. And or... if you got to run out of town, go to 50yearsofkboo.fm. Oh, nice. It's got... Um, all of the really cool audio and visual pieces. It tells the story. It's an amazing effort and um, yeah. really built out by Dawn uh, Smallman, our project manager. Yeah, so she's it's got amazing. Everything you need, including a walkthrough. Anyway, that's a cut. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Look, right on time, 2.15. Yay, thanks so much for coming. All right, you're getting kicked out.